Uh, welcome back, everyone, to our uh, second uh, panel of the day, uh, Liberalism and or Religion. My name is uh, Raul Rodriguez, and I have the, uh, the honor of introducing our three distinguished uh, speakers. But before I do that, I would like to just quickly remind everybody of the prompt uh, the speakers were given and what we were uh, thought to think about. Uh, what is the relation between religion and liberalism? In his farewell address, George Washington said, let it simply be asked, where is the security for property, for reputation, for life, if the sense of religious obligation desert the oaths which are the instruments of investigation in courts of justice? And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education on minds of particular structure, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Unquote. To what extent does national morality, the morality of liberalism in particular, depend upon religion? Can religion serve as a basis for liberalism? Or, if it does not serve as a basis for liberalism, can religion even just coexist with liberalism without decaying under its influence? Now that's the prompt, and our three speakers will, will touch on that. Our first uh, speaker is Ron Wiener, who is professor of political science at the University of Toronto uh, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He has published numerous books, uh, many of which are relevant to the topic of liberalism. Uh, and most recently, he uh, published in 2018, Dangerous Minds, Nietzsche, Heidegger, and the Return of the Far Right. Perhaps a book that we can recommend to our wayward students that are seduced by, by <coughs> the sinister teachings of Nietzsche. Um, our next uh, panelist is Jen Story. She's an assistant professor in politics and international affairs at Fermi University, where she's the executive director of the Tocqueville program. She's currently a visiting fellow in social, cultural, and constitutional studies at the American Enterprise Institute, AEI. Um, Jen and her husband, Benjamin Story, are co-authors of Why We Are Restless on the Modern Quest for Contentment, uh, an important and thoughtful examination for uh, British thinkers. I should add, since I, I know from experience of being an undergraduate uh, a while back at, at Furman, uh, that Jenna is a uh, wonderful and excellent uh, teacher and mentor and much beloved by the students there. Um, our last uh, speaker is Joshua Mitchell, who is professor of political theory at Georgetown University. He has published uh, numerous journal articles and books, uh, many of which are on, on Tocqueville, that I quite enjoy. Uh, and most recently, uh, American Awakening, Identity Politics, and Other Afflictions of Our Time. And some of his comments might to touch on that theme, and we'll uh, surely give a lot of it for us. So, uh, without any further ado, Okay, great. Uh, I'm Professor Emeritus. Uh, first of all, just a few uh, So I'd like to thank uh, Dustin and Lauren for organizing this uh, terrific event, and it's really been an honor for me to participate in it. Uh, the, the, the title of my paper is Why Liberal Democracy Can't Afford to Relax Its Commitment to Secularism. Let me start by noting that the Symposium on Science, Reason, and Modern Democracy <coughs> is especially well named since all three are under deadly assault in contemporary America. People attending this conference will surely recall that when Bill Barr was Attorney General of the United States, that, when, that is when he was the person responsible for the administration of justice in a constitutionally secular republic, he gave a widely publicized <clears throat> speech at Notre Dame Law School in which he suggested that secularism was to blame for all the ills of modern society. What would it mean to eliminate secularism as the cause of all the evils of modernity as Barr understood them? What implications would it have for the US as the kind of liberal republic that it is and that it was meant to be if a program for the purging of secularism could be success successfully carried out? These are all questions of fundamental importance, needless to say and reflective citizenship in a liberal republic of this kind, a 
obliges us to ponder them in a serious way. In recent years, it's become fashionable among political theorists to refer to our age as a post-secular age. Surprisingly, Jürgen Habermas is one of the theorists who popular, popularized this unfortunate expression. In these brief remarks, I want to consider what it means and what its broader normative significance might be. What it means, I suppose, is the widespread recognition that any hopes for full and thorough secularization on the part of late, late modern societies would not come to fruition, but on the contrary would be exposed as vain imaginings. Liberal hopes uh, for a waning of nationalism have obviously been repeatedly frustrated in a parallel fashion. Normatively, I suppose, it means that those of us who cherish such hopes should not only resign ourselves to the failure of full secularization, but should acknowledge that it's better for all of us that these hopes turned out to be false. Of course, for those who never yearned for ambitious secularization in the first place, it's cause for celebration that the aspirations of secular, secularists like me have turned out to be illusory. OK, let's start with the toughest of challenges for the secularist project, on my view, the civil rights movement of the early 1960s. No politics within my lifetime could count as nobler or more inspiring than the movement led by Martin Luther King Jr. for justice, or at least improved justice, for American blacks. But there would be no civil rights movement at all, but for the politicization of religion embodied most directly in King's politics. I can't imagine that anyone would deny or attempt to deny that the solidarities cultivated within the Southern black churches were an indispensable condition for the success of the civil rights movement. It was clearly a <clears throat> cleric-led movement, and its outcome was a decisive victory for the cause of civic justice. The politics of the civil rights movement is indeed a mode of theocratic politics, at least insofar as it invokes a theistically slash theologically privileged morality that is held to trump merely secular authorities. How does a committed secularist respond to these incontestable facts, and how does it bear on the tug of war between secularist and post-secularist visions of political life? As regards to my claim concerning a theist, theistically slash theologically privileged morality, let me just say this. While it's true that Martin Luther King, in a letter from Birmingham Jail, does appeal to the moral law or the law of God as the ultimate standard of justice, and while he does make a few references to uh, both the theology, uh, both Christian and Jewish, uh, and to the Bible, both New Testament and Old, there is literally not a single sentence in this text that the most thoroughgoing secularist should hesitate to embrace. I think that this important case does force the secularist to acknowledge that not all theocratic politics is bad politics, but most theocratic politics is. A notable illustration of theocratic politics in this post-secular age of ours is the uh, PJP government in India, as uh, Frank mentioned yesterday, this, <clears throat> this regime is post-secularist in a very direct and indeed literal sense. Post-independence India was founded on robust secularist principles aimed at privileging a conception of shared, shared citizenship elevated above the many sects and religious identities that constantly threatened to divide India on uh, sectarian or communal <coughs> lines. Michael Walter wrote a, <clears throat> wrote a very instructive book entitled The Paradox of Liberation, Secular Revolutions, and Religious Counter-Revolutions. As the title suggests, Walter's thesis is that various anti-colonial revolutions were the work of secularizing nationalists, but the states built on these secularist revolutions have been unable to sustain the secularism upon which they were founded. India is clearly a leading illustration of that pattern, but Walter also examines Israel and Algeria as instances of the same pattern. Hence, one Muslim case study, one Hindu case study, and one Jewish case study. The paradox of liberation to which Walter refers is that the political, <coughs> the political elites who spearheaded these revolutions actually intended a dual liberation. First, of course, liberation from their colonial masters, 
but then, no less importantly, uh, liberation from the backward popular religiosity that in the, in the uh, view of the founding generation in each of these cases, inhibited the masses from exercising full self-government. That, in any case, was the plan. However, once emancipation from the imperial metropolis was securely attained, subsequent generations decided uh, to rebel against that second liberation. The paradox was that the nationalist elite saw this second liberation as part and parcel of the revolutionary project, but that the populace, being liberated, did not see it that way. The attempt by the elites in each of these societies to pair a movement for national self-determination with a cultural revolution targeted at conservative religion resulted instead in a strong backlash on the part of traditionalist culture against the secularization that had been legislated for them. As Walter puts it in his uh, preface, <clears throat> India, Israel, and Algeria illustrate the secular left's difficulties with political hegemony and cultural reproduction. Turkey is ruled by the Justice and Development Party is pretty obviously another instance uh, of a uh, the similar pattern of the other, lots of other similar examples. What we have witnessed in these post-colonial societies is certainly not the whole of, but still a significant part of what has made our world a post-secularist one. The dy this dynamic of mass religiosity versus elite secularism is directly relevant to the rise of contemporary populism in India and Turkey and in elsewhere, including the United States. Walter published his book in 2015, not long after the BJP first gained power with Modi as its leader. <clears throat> the 2019 re-election of Modi only reinforces Walter's narrative, and Modi's probably going to get re-elected uh, next time around as well. <clears throat> the politics of the BJP is defined by the eager politicization of religious identity. In a society whose past has been so riven by violent religious conflict, this constitutes an actively anti-civic principle. The term Hindu nationalism perfectly captures the unity of religion and politics that is at the core of the theocratic idea. And it should be obvious that it points to something that is normatively problematic to a profound degree in a political community where 20% of the population is non-Hindu. Another significant current day example of religion's unfortunate intrusion into the political sphere, uh, certainly no less problematic or much more problematic, is uh, the contemporary Russian Orthodox Church's strong support for Putin's genocidal war in Ukraine. In fact, it's possible to add Russia to Walter's list of societies where a revolutionary elite sought to suppress religion, the outcome of which was not the creation of a secure secularism, but on the contrary, a re-embrace of robustly illiberal religion, which is obviously what the Russian Orthodox Church is in the context of Putin's repugnant regime. So what, what renders the civil rights uh, movement illegitimate and even desirable theocratic politics, whereas these other uh, cases illustrate the post-secularist politics account as illegitimate or at least undesirable. Is it just a matter of bestowing legitimacy on theocratic movements whose politics one likes and denying legitimacy to those generating political outcomes one dislikes? <clears throat> well, let me try to uh, suggest an answer to this difficult question. Although King himself might have thought otherwise, it's possible, possible to view the relationship between King's religion and King's politics in what I'll call civil religious life. His religion was fundamentally in the service of secular ends, moral and political reforms applied to an egregiously unjust civic regime. His politics were not in the service of his religion, that is, trying to spread or confer political authority on the Southern Baptist Church. To appeal to the alternatives posed to the conclusion of Book 2, Chapter 7, Russo Social Contract, when religion and politics intersect, either religion serves politics or politics serves religion. The latter is genuine theocracy, 
The former, Paul and Rousseau, can be called civil religion. In that specific sense, arguably, the politics of Martin Luther King is closer in spirit to civil religion than to theocracy. Religion in such a case may be thought of most aptly as a resource for civic mobilization, which in my view privileges the civic dimension over the religious dimension, whereas real theocracy does the opposite. That doesn't mean, of course, that it is secularist politics. It isn't, but it perhaps means that one can affirm what King's reliance on religious solidarities accomplished politically without breaking faith with the goal of eventual full secularism as a normative aspiration. <clears throat> the case is obviously radically different than something like the BJP. In that case, religion is politically mobilized in order to exalt Hinduism and Hindu identity and in order to do down Islam. The latter is directly theocratic in a way that the former isn't. And the core meaning of secularism is not re resistance to religion as such, but resistance to theocracy. My book on civil religion was intended as a defense of secularism conducted through the medium of a set of commentaries on the history of political thought. In the end of that book, prompted by, the, uh, by an Augustinian challenge put to me by my late friend Emile Perros Hossin, I, I raised, in responding to him in a footnote after he died, I raised the following question, following question, if clerical intervention from the political sphere, such as, for instance, those exemplified by King's civil rights movement, I that might be Emile's example, if these presume to represent a higher authority than merely political authority, do they not pose a challenge, uh, not just to unjust political authority, but to political authority per se? How do we avail ourselves of the sometimes salutary effects of religion in the public sphere without opening the door to theocratic politics in the, the most unattractive sense? These questions remain directly relevant here. Moreover, it would be nice to assume that appeal to a moral, uh, moral theological authority higher than merely political authority is always aligned with justice. But as I, I'm trying to sketch in these brief remarks, that assumption is hardly justified. Now, I obviously can't make a full case for secularism in the time allotted to me. I've tried to do that elsewhere. The main point I want to make here is that intellectuals or citizens who are welcoming of our new post-secularist condition are likely to do so on account of a radical forgetfulness, or more likely a, a, a taking for granted, of the hard-won, hard-won goods uh, of a secularist dispensation. To live in a secularist polity means that we inhabit a society where women won't be arrested or perhaps lashed for wearing the wrong clothes or listening to the wrong music, where no one will be accused of blasphemy or heresy, where one group of religionists won't suffer, suffer from groans at the hands of or have their villages raised by some other group of religionists, where gender equality won't be put out of reach by appealing to sacred scriptures. Achievement of a secular regime means living in a society where religion is largely, though never completely, privatized, where liberty of individual judgments is vastly expanded, and where religion's power of policing sexuality, historically, surely one of the chief sources of religion's social and political power, where that power is dramatically curtailed. We all know that the evil summarized above plagued societies in the West for many centuries, and they continue to plague many inadequately secularized societies right up to the present day. Secularism is above all a repudiation of theocracy, that's the intervention of clerical authority in the government of citizens, qua citizens. And the idea that secularism is somehow <clears throat> redundant or outdated or no longer is or ought to be a dominant civic aspiration, opens the door to potential abuses of political authority that post-Enlightenment societies battle mightily to overcome. People who talk about post-secularism as something to be welcomed or embraced are, I would suggest, in need of some sharp reminders about what life was like in a pre-secular age. 
Now, in setting the topic for this panel, we were asked to reflect on George Washington's famous thesis that neither reason nor experience allows to think that it's possible for national morality to prevail in exclusion of religious principle. No disrespect to Washington, but his suggestion here seems astonishingly innocent with respect to people's unlimited capacity to profess X and practice Y. Their penetrating insights on this score in uh, Pierre Bale, which I try to explore chapter 14 of civil religion, but even theorists who considered themselves champions of religion, seen as morally salutary, didn't fail to acknowledge that the relationship, the relationship between religion and morality is far more problematic than is suggested in Washington's statement. Montesquieu wrote, one enters into disputes concerning dogma, and one in no way practices morality. Why? Because practicing morality is difficult, and pursuing disputes concerning dogma is very easy. Rousseau wrote, I saw that there were professions of faith, doctrines, forms of worship that were followed without belief, and that since nothing at all penetrated either heart or reason, it influenced conduct very little. Tocqueville wrote, I am revolted every day when I see petty people who are capable of every sort of despicable and violent action talking devoutly of their holy religion. I am always tempted to shout at them, rather than be Christians of this kind, be pagans with pure conduct, proud of your soul, and with clean hands. As Reinhold Niebuhr rightly said, it is as difficult to get charity out of piety as to get reasonableness out of rationalism. Okay, let me close by highlighting one further important aspect of the question of secularism. There's a huge cleavage between theocratic politics and secularist politics that I would explicate as follows. We are trying to decide whether to build expressways or build public transit, decide whether to give high priority or low priority to policies aimed at addressing climate change, or to decide whether to pursue a multilateral foreign policy or a unilateral one, there are in principle tangible worldly outcomes that will eventually tend to vindicate one side or the other. The quality of these income outcomes will always be contested by people with opposing political convictions. But there is at least something in the world to which one can, in principle, appeal in pursuing these debates. The case is quite otherwise, seems to me, when we attempt to guide political life according to appeals to the realm of divinity appeal to God's preferences, in effect. When Moses, in chapter 31 of Numbers, invokes divine authority in launching genocidal warfare against the Midianites, there's obviously no independent way of testing whether uh, Moses is God or any God really wants this. We have seen something similar, in fact, in our own time, ISIS, the most horrifying version of theocratic politics imaginable claiming divine sanction for crimes no less brutal than those in Numbers chapter 31. When Barack Obama decided in favor of military invention against the then Caliphate in, uh, in Iraq and Syria, he gave a TV address on September 10, 2014, in which he stated quite confidently that the Islamic State is not Islamic, and it is certainly not a state. Unfortunately, there was a problem with this pronouncement. One has to ask, how is Obama equipped to settle the theological question of which is more authentically Islamic? Uh, these, the Islam of contemporary liberal Muslims or the Islam of the conquering caliphs of early uh, Islamic history? God or Allah doesn't speak to any of us, so it's intrinsically open question whether he prefers the liberal Muslims of today or the Ill illiberal Muslims of the 17th century, uh, of the 7th century. The illiberal Muslims of the 7th century. There's no independent way of, uh, there's no way of independently adjudicating this. Well, when I wrote this prior, I didn't think uh, Graham, Graham would, be, would be in the office, so it's uh, kind of funny. Uh, this, to be sure, is an extreme example of why it's problematic to base political claims on theological claims. So in fact, it applies to all attempts to found a politics on a theology. Christian pacifists who assert that God demands that we desist from all wars face exactly the same problem. 
appealing to what God requires of us is politically problematic because it's epistemologically problematic. Basing its politics on something that is intrinsically unknowable. It's unknowable, both because we can't know that there is a God, and because if there is a God, we can't know, apart from the dogmatic claims of non-universal religious traditions, what that God actually wants. God may be a warmonger, as Moses and Joshua seem to believe, and as the late Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi uh, also believed, and it's a current uh, belief, can add currently shared by the Russian Orthodox Church, so it seems, or God may be a pacifist, as Christ believed, and as uh, Stanley Howard believed. We just don't know. If Patriarch Kirill proclaimed, supposedly on God's authority, that Putin's war is just, God will not cry down from the heavens that Kirill is a liar and a thug. This gives us good reason to found our politics on desirable worldly outcomes that are available to public or intersubjective inspection rather than on invisible or inscrutable divine predilections. Bringing religion into politics requires us to do something that are, we are in principle incapable of doing, adjudicating among, in Salman Rushdie's vivid phrase, fictional sky gods. This is part of the reason why the great thinkers of the Enlightenment starting with Spinoza's theological and political treatise and Locke's concerning the letter concerning toleration, committed themselves to a secularist political vision. The notion that something good awaits us in a new age beyond secularism is not a happy or attractive one and should be resisted. Now, I should fail to uh, spell out that my problems with religion are in the first instance uh, intellectual ones though the intellectual problems and the political problems overlap. Certainly, the, mono, the monotheistic religions presuppose a conception of God according to which God is directly implicated in and cares about various dramas unfolding historically among human beings on this planet. Just how plausible is it that if there were a God, that God would be moved by geocentric preoccupations of this kind? Consider the following observation by the philosopher Simon Blackburn. Blackburn. Homo sapien has existed for the blink of an eye as a small fraction of the biomass in one small planet on the edge of a galaxy with over 100 billion stars, itself one of some of the 500 billion other galaxies. It would be very wasteful if that were all just for us. I say that the intellectual problems and the political problems overlap because it strikes me as something that would seriously impugn our civic experience if it were expected as a basis for shared political membership that people embrace beliefs that seem highly dubious as most conventional religious beliefs do. Americans currently inhabit a political culture where the very idea of truth is under daily assault and viewed from the, from the perspective of religious agnostic and political liberal, the religions that are politically salient in contemporary America appear not to be helping in maintaining a healthy and politically essential attachment to the idea of truth. Authority of two, you know, authorities here for that. 
I don't know if that's true exactly, but it's a significant enough phenomenon that a number of people have commented on it. And I think it's important to start there in a way. In other words, to start from the view that uh, there are a, a number of young people coming out of universities primarily who agree with Fani that the Buddhism and religion are at odds, but are taking an opposite conclusion to that, um, that perspective. They're siding with religion or with some kind of Judaism and um, rejecting liberalism. So why? And as I said, we're going to start with trying to understand where they are and then think about how we might refine our diet to correct our views. And in the last panel, this became a kind of pedagogical debate that I'm very interested so I'd uh, love to talk about that further. But in thinking about this for the panel, I had tried to connect with my students as I've seen them change in their opinions about liberalism over the years. And I thought about how they change in their reaction to Locke as he comes up in this report from Plot so that okay. they teach it. Yeah. Um, for a long time, they wrestled with Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, Machiavelli, and found these thinkers uh, strange and confusing. But when they came to Locke, they seemed to come home, right? They felt that something was comforting and validating of what they were thinking. But it, it's really the case that the mood has changed on that in the place of uh, like Herman. Um, meeting Locke, my students do see themselves in their world in the mirror, I'd say, nowadays. But it's a kind of revelation for them. They see it as, here's the secret source of all of my problems, right? It's what Patrick described and why the world hasn't failed. I think he created this reaction, but he crystallized. So I asked myself, what do our students find so shocking about Locke or horrifying about Locke? And I think there are two related issues. The first one might be more apparent because it has a more obvious and established political expression and outlet. And that's the issue of Locke's disregard for the worth and beauty of nature and the suggestion that the earth deserves to be inherited by the industrious and rational. I don't like that. The second, uh, less fully crystallized reaction to Locke is, uh, surprisingly, in my view, to his insistence that, all, insistence that all legitimate relationships are grounded in consent. Um, that's a little more um, surprising to me, because, and it's a little bit less coate, because you're not exactly sure where that's going to go. I think students are reacting to this so strongly, in part because there's a number of them literally close to home at this time of their lives. Many of them have, uh, have undergone a painful in the parents, which often seems to happen at a kind of lock approved moment first year of college. Um, just us. I mean, I've just dealt with this at that time again. Um, and they read this and they're like, what? No. <laughs> um, it, it, they've also just been through college orientation sessions, um, which takes whatever dignity, the con which I, I think the, the con conception of consent has a dignity, but it has removed whatever dignity that. Um, conception might have, uh, it's showing them sort of hand-handed videos and giving them tech catchphrases, basically rendering a very important concept of farce. Um, so I think they're seeing through when they hear Locke talking about consent, they're seeing through that, they're seeing in that concept something that has been forced in upon them by authorities and has not actually served them well in their own lives. I'm not, valid, I'm not saying this is a, a very thoughtful, considered um, response, but it is their official response. Okay, so I'm going to say the two issues that they have a problem with in Locke, um, the disposition towards nature and the disposition he suggests should guide our relationships from, with one another, aren't seems to be connected because the question of how we should relate to our fellow human beings is bound up with the question of how we relate to the highest thing of being, nature or God. And uh, the paths they take, whether it's to go with the kind of Nietzschean-inspired uh, version of things that sees nature as a struggle for power, relationships we've made in that image, or the other way, reflect that um, reflect that, that, that combination of seeing our relation to the highest thing and our relation to each other as a package. So my question here is, how do those who are curious about integralism, or more generally about religion, understand God and what kind of relationships he expects human beings to have with him and with each other? And I think this theological question is important to answer in order to attain an adequate perspective on the question of the relation of liberalism to religion, whether how whether and how the two are antithetical, and if they are, what religious people living in a liberal society should do about it. But from the perspective of an actually religious person, those questions can't be posed in the abstract. 
as if they were a sociological matter. They must be answered with reference to a specific understanding of what God is and what he demands of his creatures. In the rush to escape the perceived harms of liberalism, though, these important questions can be overlooked. Um, studying them and talking about them is, I think, one of the important ways we can help guide young people who are disposed to object to liberalism in the religion today. So for this presentation, I'm going to give a slightly more extended treatment of two authors who um, have come up in passing a number of times during this conference, Carl Schmidt and Pierre Menon. So I take Carl Schmidt because primarily because he's attractive to a lot of people. So, and I take Menon just to put my cards on the table at the beginning because I think he proposes what is potentially a better alternative. But both Schmidt and Menon are critics of uh, liberalism, and they both criticize liberalism um, for its hypocrisy or aggressive lack of self-knowledge. I think in that they echo the point that Brian made yesterday, and put more gently, and I think a little more accurately, that liberals are not always upfront about the fact that liberal, a liberal order is a uh, form of rule. Right. Schmidt and Menas see this characteristic of liberalism as closely related to its hostility to religion. But their thoughts afford us the opportunity of comparing two different ways of conceiving this antagonism based on two different understandings of the Christian God, and consequently two different ways of thinking about how human beings should relate to him and to each other, as well as what a religious person should do in the liberal world. And so I offer this and inspired by, uh, with by what Eric Nelson uh, did yesterday, um, showing us how the quarrel of liberalism is intertwined from its origins with the quarrel over what God is and what he demands of us. And this is what I took from the presentation in the book. Um, I think that angle of approach affords us a way to understand uh, liberalism more deeply, but it's particularly important for those who reject liberalism in the name of religion. Okay, so to start with Carl Schmitt. What is liberalism for Schmitt? As I indicated, but actually most fundamentally, is a form of hypocrisy. As his most enduringly famous book, The Concept of the Political, makes clear, liberalism is a systematic effort in his view to obscure what he calls the political. And it does this by distracting us from the need for decision. The mechanism by which it distracts us is by causing our attention to oscillate between discussion based ethics, in which the right way are ways to live and emerge without any authoritative judgment, and market based economics which what's best for all spontaneously arises from the interplay of individual desires. When our attention oscillates between ethics and economics, conceived of in this way, we become both blind and antagonistic to things that can be not left, this is all shit, by the way, don't say it in time, get left up to free and open-ended thoughts or efforts, and to relationships not grounded in the rational consent of free individuals. That's why the main thing that liberalism obscures in Schmitt's view is the political. Which, is, which in his telling springs into being out of the need to decide upon the way of life that will define a group of people and to determine who's a friend and who's an enemy. This determination is the essential underpinning of the authoritative demand that a group may sometimes have to make for that individual to die for the sake of its way of life. A demand that Schmidt emphasizes can never be the simple result of a recent argument, and that moreover definitively ends the discussion. The relationships we form politically are for Schmidt neither based in rational consent nor shaped around the shared good, but sealed by an essential decision. Now, liberal thinking encourages the fantasy, Schmidt argues, that you'll never have to decide on way of life. That this is a fantasy is proven, or almost proven, he argues, by the fact that there is indeed a specifically liberal way of life, and a liberal decision about who counts as a friend and who counts as an enemy to that way. Liberalism has failed to elude the political Schmidt concludes and succeeds in only being especially hypocritical. Liberal hypocrisy is on Schmitt's view closely related to its opposition to religion, um, which you can see most clearly by looking at what it says about nature, because it says about human nature. Liberals encourage people on Schmitt's view to believe that they are naturally good or innocent, and therefore that freeing themselves from oppressive systems and institutions will naturally bring about a more rational society based on consensual relationships that maximize every human being's good. A religious perspective, on the other hand, most fundamentally as sinful or in need of redemption from some source outside of themselves, rather than capable of using their freedom to reason about how to live well without outside assistance. Whereas the religious view on Schmitt's account entails the recognition that human beings need an authority who makes a decision, decision about spiritual matters or truths that are, in his perspective, not able to be known or even approached by reason, the liberal view paints all authority as oppression, regards theological reasoning as irrational, and yet dogmatically insists on the unquestionable rationality 
is it systematically refusing to see the kinds of claims religious anthropology makes that the liberal view aligns itself to its own limits. So this antipathy of religion to liberalism, or liberalism rather to religion, indicates that Schmidt sees some kind of theological dimension to the question of what liberalism is. But can his, his puzzle become more precise about what Schmidt's understanding of what he thought is and what he demands of his creatures? One approach would be to try to understand the theological significance of decision for him uh, by looking at how it appears in, in his various works. In his Civilitation Shift of Law and Judgment, he lays out the puzzle that there is, as he says, an unbridgeable gap between the juridical norm and the facts of the case, which the decision of the judge must mysteriously bridge. Judicial reasoning is important to prepare and present the, the uh, decision, but can't literally be what leads to the decision, because reason cannot bridge the unbridgeable gap. In the next book, The Meaning of the State and the Value of the Individual, Schmidt articulates an analogous problem having to deal now with the state, which to justify its use of power must appeal to the norm, and yet because right might exist in two conceptually different spheres, and his view could never logically derive the need for force from the norm. In this work, he makes the theological resonance of his view clear. The timeless correctness of the norm must be, quote, sacrificed like an innocent victim to come into the world and serve his guidance for human life. Now, to be clear, Schmidt's understanding of radical otherness, of the radical otherness of the norm and its purity, doesn't mean that judicial decision is rationally inexplicable, or that judges should just proceed in their work by fascism and consideration. This whole effort in that first book I mentioned, Law of Judgment, is to establish a knowable standard for juridical decisions that allows for a measure of written judicial independence and consequently jurisprudential integrity. The conclusion he comes to in that work is that judges must assess their decisions according to what other judges in the polity Side, and not by a direct appeal to a norm or a supposed standard of natural law, or common good for that matter, which in Schmidt's mind is beyond <coughs> the capacity of the human mind to know. This is a matter, this is a way of being honest in Schmidt's language about what judges are actually doing. The model Schmidt offers here fits with his understanding of what constitutes a particularly Catholic approach to reason, which he says in Roman Catholicism and Catholic Reform takes a method of proof, takes as a method of proof specifically juridical logic. By this he means that Catholic argumentation begins with the truths revealed by the incarnation embodied in the institutions and doctrines of the church and continues in that tradition to further lay out its logic. Human reason has work to do for Schmidt only under the umbrella of revelation or decision. So Schmidt has often called a decisionist and I think for good reasons his decision is central to his thought. It is often taken to mean that he relishes the thought of a strong leader or even wants to promote moral courage, we talked about this morning. But I think a more accurate portrayal of the importance of decision for Schmidt, to Schmidt would focus on his desires and efforts to prove that decision is an unavoidable fact of human life and to expose the hypocrisy of those who would deny this. Um, you can see in his early work before he really gets to any political matters, he put his Protestants in this category. For example, and the question is really about honesty or hypocrisy rather than anything like approach. Um, this is so important to Schmidt because it proves to him that we are subjects in the continual drama of bridging the unbridgeable gap between the divine and the human. And indeed, it seems to be at times uh, tantamount for Schmidt to acknowledging that there is a God who must sacrifice himself to enter the world. So that's why I think he takes such great pains repeatedly to defend his claim that Thomas Hobbes is a truly political thinker and indeed a Christian. Uh, he writes many times about this, and there's a book that he writes in the Nazi era that has written about this, perhaps an, perhaps an exception to this, it's debatable. But for example, in his last words on this in 1963 and in 1965, he returns to try to argue again, Hobbes is a political thinker, he is a Christian thinker. You see this perhaps most clearly, well, in both of those works, but in the 1963 editions of the Concepts of the Political, he says that um, Hobbes' sovereign did not end the state of nature problem by proclaiming just anything about the character of the divine, but had to say that Jesus is the Christ. And Schmitz, view this is not interchangeable, this is a quote, with Allah is great, or any other social ideal, highest value or fundamental postulate, because the sentiment that Jesus is the Christ, as a purely spiritual being, sacrifice itself to enter the material world, is itself, according to Schmidt, a theological expression of the necessity of decisions. Schmidt furthermore makes it clear that he thinks this realization is embedded of Hobbes' thought, regardless of Hobbes' own personal religiosity or subjective belief, as it were. Acknowledging the need for decision is acknowledging the reality of Christ. 
Schmidt's view of the antagonism between liberalism and religion is based on his particular conception of what God is and what he asks of human beings. The Christian God, according to Schmidt, asks above all that we acknowledge our inability to reach into the realm of pure spirit and that we admit that our reason depends on this mysterious engagement with the human world. Such an acknowledgement is represented for Schmidt in the honest admission that it's a fact of human life that decisions, inexplicable bridges between the material and the, and the spiritual realms, are necessary. The truly diabolical nature of liberalism in his mind is that it does everything possible to obscure that fact. What should a Christian in a liberal world do? Schmidt's rejection of liberalism is, I think, overly focused, as a misunderstanding, on the um, exposure of the hypocrisy of the liberal perspective. And just one indication of this is that he eventually comes around to embracing the Nazi regime, which he initially opposed, by praising the political honesty of the current German generation for ironing out the confiscations of the Latin so long introducing Schmidt, which I hope I will <laughs> communicate. Um, because uh, I, I think I was trying to take this interest in Schmidt seriously and really investigate whether he is a serious moral or theological guy. I don't think so, but I had to really figure that out. Um, I'll spend a little less time on here now, although I think it's really worth reading. Um, Menon offers a critique of liberalism that in some ways echoes Schmidt's. He, however, has a different understanding of what religion is. Is and what he demands of his creatures that causes him to see the relation between uh, liberalism and religion in a way that differs, provides a different answer to the question of how to restore religion in a world, or how to deal with religion in a world dominated by liberal perspective. Now, I go Schmidt in arguing that contemporary liberalism is defined by a dogmatic insistence on openness. That, as he puts it in a lecture delivered at Lynch Madame Cathedral in 2004, which is called Reason and Faith, a Lenten Reflection is the consequence of a centuries-long project in the West to establish a purely rational political order, one based on experimentation and ver verification. Similarly to Schmidt, Menat identifies the aim of this order to be to free human beings from the ostensibly oppressive weight of arbitrary tradition, but ultimately to liberate them from any heteronomous law. Because of Menat's view this goal is impossible, as we always look at laws that are not of our own making, liberalism tends to hypocritically obscure the fact Such an order, Menon argues, is based on enthusiasm about the capacity of human reason, but paradoxically tends to create a society that is markedly indifferent to truth. The quest for truth, Menon writes, disintegrates into an endless scientific discussion that makes vague promises to meet up with the truth in some indefinite future. Liberal societies oscillate, Menon continues, between this faith in science and the uncritical acceptance of its least examined prejudices as values. Reason in this rational political order shrinks from its highest aspirations. And the result is that people in liberal societies tend to hypocritically pride themselves on their rationality while indulging their prejudices. So one might say that, that Manon, like Schmidt, thinks that an unwarranted trust in the power of human reason cuts us off from the truth. While that's accurate in some ways, there's an important difference between the two thinkers. Whereas Schmidt thinks that reliance on reason blinds us to its dependence on the, inexplicable, on the inexplicable entry of divine truth into the world, Menon thinks that an overestimation of reason's powers prevents us from making judgments that one might call morally certain. In other words, reasoned but not fully verifiable conjectures about how human beings were meant by God or nature to live. Indeed, as Menon says in a recent book, Natural Law and Human Rights, the psychological and political theories of early modern thinkers such as Machiavelli and Hobbes were designed to forestall precisely this kind of practical reason about the good. To remedy the problems modern liberalism has brought in its wake, we need to recover practical reason in all things. A necessary companion, perhaps, to recover the competence of the judgment of its heart. And not thinks that the recovery of practical reason will, perhaps paradoxically, be aided by a better understanding of what faith is. Like Schmidt, Menon argues that there's a connection between the way modern liberal thinking undermines its own ostensible rationalism and its tendency, tendency to be hostile to faith or religion. But his understanding of what faith is differs from Schmidt's. For Menon, it's a mode of approaching the truth that differs from but can be complementary to reason. Faith is exemplified by listening and waiting for Menon, whereas reason is characterized by the ongoing effort to link sight, including the sight of the mind's eye, imagination, and thought, with touch or verify. Faith, Menon writes, attains its objects without seeing or touching it. It, quote, suspends human effort and waits for everything, hopes for everything. 
this understanding of the human relation to the divine acknowledges as a Schmidt, the gap between what a person can know by his own devices and what God can give. But it outlines a relationship between the human and the divine that is not best described as a mysterious bridge of an unbridgeable gap, but rather a personal relationship in which the careful poise of the faithful mind, suspending, waiting, hoping, is responded to by God who wills the human good. This understanding of the nature of faith is friendly to the view that our own efforts can be involved in the quest to understand God and conform to its wishes. Accordingly, Menal writes that reason and faith can each benefit from understanding the logic of the other. Faith unquestioned by reason, not without being interrogated about the basis for its belief, can degenerate to mere sentiment, shrink into itself, out of embarrassment. But faith too has something to say to reason, which is in his words, that is insufficient to meet the task it sets itself. Quote, however necessary and even noble may be the work of reason, the moment comes when one must consent to allow the truth to come to us. Otherwise, the inability of reason to find the truth unaided, combined with modern deafness to the claims of faith, causes reason to lose sight of truth as the goal of its efforts. The relationship between God and human beings suggested by Menal's conception of faith was elaborated in what he presents as a good version of modern Western political life which is based, he argues, in the conviction that there is a covenant between the divine goodness and human freedom. He finds instances of this in the early modern nation states that were aligned with churches or with religious traditions more broadly, and encourage us to see the habit of public prayer in those times, alignment with us, was sincere. They were praying for their efforts to be consistent with God's desire, in a way, I think, constant with what Diana spoke about this morning, Thanksgiving proclamations. The covenantal model is also Menel's model of political law, and what defines it is the process by which a person offers himself to the whole and receives himself back transformed. It's got interesting things to say, and this, this, I think the, the best way to conceive of it is like when you start a family and you become a different person, mom or dad, and yet you still remain yourself. Right? So he has a citizenship, a conception of citizenship that, that parallels that. Relationships are essentially covenantal in Menel's view. Because the Christian God leaves things substantially up to us, urging human beings to participate in the unfolding of providence. Faith that our efforts will be met by the responsiveness of the divine, or at least the responsiveness of the good, as Menon puts it, is essential to the vigorous political action of the early modern period. Its loss in our world has not liberated human action, but points out, but caused us to believe that we are the helpless subjects of overwhelming forces. That's because attempting to rely on reason alone, or not, is like trying to walk on one foot. A reason less hostile to faith would give us the confidence to engage in practical reason and political action. Um, I, I didn't look at the beginning of time, so I keep looking at my watch. And uh, yeah, I think you for too long. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm looking down, but I'm not remembering when I started, so that's not helpful. Okay, so I, I'll just. <laughs> I think it was where I wanted to Okay, okay. Um, okay, so. In uh, Menon's book, Natural Law and Human Rights, he gives us an understanding of what a reason revived by faith might look like, which is, I think, um, along the lines of what Deneen was uh, suggesting yesterday, uh, a way to understand that nature might have a telos that is, um, that's, that does not, that is, uh, those reasons are uh, revived by faith, but not something that people who are not faith cannot understand. And I think I'll just leave that for questions. Um, so uh, let me conclude by returning, as uh, Bronnie did, to the question, uh, to the remark that Washington made about whether um, religion is needed to support morality. Uh, and I agree with you, it's, it's hardly that simple. Um, what I've tried to say here is that um, Schwitz's theology is not a good guide to moral life. It doesn't even pretend to be. It's not a good thinker. It thinks morality is beyond the content of the moral positions, beyond the, uh, that which human mind, uh, excuse me, human mind can know. He is very good at stirring up excitement about morality. I think he's morally exciting, as I put it, and perhaps my book Strauss's comment. Um, but he's not good at helping us think about moral obligations that may even undermine our disposition to fulfill them. And I think that's as a result of the particular theology that he follows. Um, the Nas theology suggests a different way to deal with the distortions of, with, that dis the distortions of the world may introduce into intellectual um, one of the most helpful aspects of Menon's work in natural law and human rights is, to, I think, to direct our attention away from the liberal anti-liberal debate. 
because there he's asking us to think about the, the potential of human ends that we can understand by, by a kind of um, practical reason. I think I'm going to talk about that um, later. I, I do think that the, the anti liberal anti liberal debate is a, is a brilliant way to organize a conference, but isn't actually the way that we should approach political life. It would be more useful to ask questions like what role freedom should play in this regime at this time to establish the conditions in which people can live well. So the character of the Jugad, of course, cannot be determined by the character of what we need today in our political life. So what am I trying to say here? First, I'm in sympathy with uh, the presentation Ronnie made when he says that we shouldn't rush people into a post-secular world. That's a reactive term, and it gestures for a whole host of different things. And yet we shouldn't think that beyond the limits of reason all is welter and waste. There are articulated theologies, many more developed than those I presented here, and they have different consequences for our political lives. We can help young people who are disposed to adapt liberalism in the name of religion to consider those different theologies carefully. For those tempted to reject liberalism in the name of religion should feel a particular moral way to do this and to consider carefully what they take. about new fortifications, no consensus. If liberalism is locked, which lock? The lock of the theologians, who set him comfortably among the reformers? Or the lock of the political theorists, who ask that he play one or another part, repudiator of nature, innovator of individualism, proto-capitalist, foundation layer for limited government, in the drama of crisis and modernity. If liberalism is Tocco, which Tocco? The aristocrat? who thought the democratic age too stable to endure, or the liberal who believed mediating institutions could save us from democratic despotism. The Tocqueville of Democracy, Volume 2, Part 1, Chapter 5, suggested that Christianity served a social purpose and liberal regimes and nothing more, or the Tocqueville of Democracy, Volume 1, Part 2, Chapter 9, who believed that Christianity answered the deepest longings of the soul and gave man hope that, quote, the incomplete joys of the world would be endured. If by Christianity we mean a set of beliefs, which ones? And why those beliefs and not others? If by Christianity we mean a set of habits, why are one set of habits, but not another, the ones that undergird liberalism? If by Christianity we mean morality, the salutary sort, do we still need Christian religion, as Washington suggested in his farewell address? Or can we have morality without Christian religion? Beware the copula and in the formulation of liberalism. And religion. I won't enter into the debate of any of these long standing, never needle moving arguments about liberalism and Christianity. I'll approach our subject instead by considering a contemporary phenomenon of identity politics and ask this question What is the posture of this deformation of Christianity toward liberalism? And what might it tell us about the relationship between liberalism and Christianity? Liberalism in practice, rather than theory, involves a settled constellation that includes the rule of law, consent of the government, checks and balances, government instituted to protect pre-existing rights rather than to invent and grant them, separation between church and state, periodic elections, and other things. Partisans of the left and the right will argue about whether identity politics seeks to supplant liberalism with a new regime type, or whether, and this is especially true of members of the left in my generation, identity politics is contiguous with an expression of the left of center but still liberal aspirations of the 1960s. I think this latter posture is serious misreading the moment. I will not, however, assay the constellation of liberalism point by point with a view to distinguishing it from identity politics. I offer the constellation of arrangements and institutions associated with liberalism practice so that we might be reminded of the overarching fact, namely, that together they suppose what I will call the politics of competence. By this I mean it would strain credulity to claim that those liberal arrangements and institutions could work without a competent, competent citizenry. No competent citizenry, no liberal politics. Before turning to identity politics, which is predicated in some 
but something quite different than the politics of confidence, we might observe that progressives responded to Tocquevillean worry about the dwindling of citizen confidence in the very way Tocqueville himself predicted. In Volume 1, Part 1, Chapter 5, he wrote, a very civilized society finds it hard to tolerate attempts at freedom in the local community. It is disgusted with its numerous blunders and is apt to despair of success before the experiment is finished. Dubious that citizen competence could save the liberal experiment in America, progressives opted instead for expert competence. The second phase of the American regime entailed an increased administrative centralization, disciplined initially by constraints imposed by the golden dollar, but more recently expanding exponentially thanks to fiat currency and perhaps just in time for the collapse of the US dollar as the local reserve currency, modern monetary theory. Is progressivism a decisive break? from the founders' vision of competent citizens. In one sense, of course, yes it is. But yet it holds together a commitment to competence, expert competence that's different than citizen competence. But competence matters. Identity politics, which is now upon us, departs from both and so represents a new phase of the American regime. What matters to identity politics is not the politics of competence, but rather what I would call the politics of innocence and transgression. If you doubt this tectonic shift is happening right under your feet, ponder the extent to which tens of millions of Americans seek to demonstrate to their neighbors that they stand with innocent victims everywhere, with a view to not being numbered among the irredeemable transgressors. This phenomenon, badly misnamed virtue signaling, is better understood as innocence signaling. So that social death, cancellation, purgation passes over you, American citizens must indicate on their front lawn their office floor, their car's bumper, in fact, it means that they, quote, support BLM, DEI, ESG, that they believe in climate change even as they jet off to their favorite vacation spots, that they stand with Ukraine, etc. The politics of competence matters less and less. The politics of innocence and transgression matters more and more. This is neither the founder's vision nor the progressive vision. Why have the several factions of the conservative movement failed to understand and address identity politics? The, the default position of both, it seems, is that identity politics is a continuation of cultural Marxism that long marks the institutions. How convenient if that were the case, for no additional work would need to be undertaken to understand it. And critics could continue to bemoan the ongoing losses on the battlefront of cultural Alas, identity politics has required no long marks to our institutions. It has met with no resistance. Indeed, it has been welcomed as Marxism never was. We need a smart answer to why the success of one has been so rapid, while the other has never really taken hold in America. Here I think Tokyo was again helpful, helpful in understanding the big picture. <coughs> Writing about the French Revolution, he called the French Revolution an incomplete religion by which he meant it less destroyed Christianity than replaced it with fragments of Christianity. Liberty, equality, fraternity, were these not the promise of a post-lapsarian order, complete with a new calendar without the social stratification that sinful human societies always produce? The French Revolution, the brotherhood of saints without God the Father. Marxism, no less contemptuous of Christianity than the French revolutionaries, also promulgated an incomplete religion. Man, cast out of the identic splendor of primitive communism, stands now, because of the productivity unleashed by cruel capitalism, on the threshold and the penury of laboring amidst the thorns of creation for his daily bread. In the 20th century, national socialism, that socialism and fascism also ravaged Europe. These were, however, unlike the French Revolution and Marxism, they were not incomplete versions of Christianity. They were deliberately anti-Christian movements who sought to re-enchant the world by rekindling pagan tropes. They have faded. The reverberations of the first and second incomplete religions have not, I suspect, because the religious need is eternal. When Christianity falters, one or another incomplete religion will step into the vacuum. You do not get secularism after Christianity falters. You get distorted, fragmentary remnants of Christianity. Path dependency matters. Earlier phases are not superseded. The conservative movement in America has focused a great deal of attention on these two incomplete religions I have mentioned. Indeed, from its very beginning to the present day, they have been its target. On the one hand, we see the stringent defense of tradition 
against the equalizing tendencies of the French Revolution and of progressivism that American movement also dedicated to the destruction of mediating institutions. On the other hand, we see what was before 1989 its counterbalancing contingent, possible to Marx's vision and thoroughly modern, which hallowed Smith and Hayek and the free markets they thought important for supports of liberty. I do not see anything new here by noting that the current reconfiguration happening within the conservative movement has involved the rise of the traditionalists and the fall of the libertarians, which is to say the rise of those who, whose fight was with the first community of religion and the fall of those whose fight was the second community of religion. Those in the former camp have now found renewed confidence after decades in which the free market veto, to use his own memorable term, prevailed. This shift may satisfy a long suppressed contingent of the conservative movement, but it will not help conservatives in the least in understanding the third incomplete religion, which is now upon us, the incomplete religion of identity politics. Today, America faces a far greater challenge, I think its greatest to date. Conservatives who have battled the first two incomplete religions of the French Revolution and Marxism have little understanding of what is now upon them. They employ their old weapons, but they are useless against a new enemy. This new enemy has captivated one portion of America by its promise of a spiritually purified world. The penetration of identity politics into our institutions and into our minds has been extraordinarily rapid, while Marxism never really took hold in America. Why has this happened? The answer, that Marxism's fundamental category was class, which Americans never really were going to accept, while the fundamental category of identity politics is guilt, which residually Christians Christian Americans are haunted by, gives us a clue about what identity politics is and suggests something important about the relationship between liberalism and Christianity. Recall Bogland's famous formulation that Marxism immunitizes the eschaton. By this he meant that Marxism offered modern man who had religious longings, even if his religious tastes had soured, a redemptive narrative of history as Christianity did. Identity politics, the third of the religion now upon us, does something different. It immunitizes the scapegoat. A Christian heresy, while at the same time affirming that a scapegoat is necessary to take away the sins of the world, an article of Christian faith. What does all this mean? Consider for our baseline the emblematic 1741 Jonathan Edwards sermon, Sinners in the Hands of the Angry God. Man, tainted by sin, can only be saved by Christ, the sacrificial lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Moral cleanliness and purity are unachievable by mortal effort alone. Everything on this side of heaven is impure. Because uncleanliness cannot cleanse itself, only Christ, the divine corruption, who is without spot and blemish, can atone for man's uncleanliness and save him from the eternal fires to which his uncleanliness condemns him. Identity politics offers a variant at once unthinkable without Christianity, at once a defection from it. Then, in Puritan America as now, Man's stain is the consuming issue. In the contemporary version of Edward's sermon, moral cleanliness and purity are not purchased by the scapegoating of Christ at Calvary, but rather by scapegoating another person or human group who is said to be responsible for the sins of the world. Not all of mankind are his unclean, declared the new life, just for the moment the white race. All of us gather together under the category people of color, non-heteronormative, etc are in fact clean, that one must pay, the other is to receive just compensation. Let us purge the unclean ones from our midst. If you happen to be white, you must convince yourself that not you, but rather those other white people are filthy and irredeemably stained. They must pay eternally so that your white ledger carries no balance. That is why you put Black Lives Matter signs in your front lawn. That is the way social death passes over you, but not your neighbor, who by virtue of having no sign must be a racist. In the new American awakening that is identity politics, cathartic rage is directed toward whiteness and all that is wrought in human history. Cast one group and all that is wrought in the eternal fires of hell so that another group can be saved. How do these two American awakenings differ with respect to how they understand debt and payment? In the first great awakening, God's grace and forgiveness heal man, cover over his will, and cancel the debt owed to God man could not pay. A divine gift alone cleanses the world and pays off man's debts, so that tomorrow might be lived with a clean ledger. The relationship of debt and payment, so to speak, is vertical. 
the audacious wager of the new American awakening and his identity politics is that the gift of Christ's blood sacrifice is meaningless, indeed an embarrassment that no one in good company need talk about. There are no gifts for which we should be thankful, no payment made on our behalf, no mercy that must be extended to others because it was divinely extended to us. Hope, faith, and charity are foolishness. Equity, by which we mean here retribution, is the order of the day. Equity is the never ending reminder to the irredeemables that tomorrow, their tomorrow, can never be left with a clean ledger. Equity is the never ending reminder that the relationship between debt and payment is, so to speak, horizontal. In the New American Awakening, justice involves the calculation of what one group permanently owes another, not the thankful this man should show God every minute of every day that he has life and breath, which is beyond price. We must clearly understand where culpability lies in these two strangely related frames. For the Christian, for Jonathan Edwards, the convenient lie man tells himself is that he is innocent. The very first words uttered by Adam in Genesis reveal the creature was who hides from his culpability. In the beginning, we might say, was the narcissist. Look not to me, I am innocent, fault lies elsewhere. Do not disturb my good image of myself. Catastrophe then follows catastrophe. The Bible is its chronicle. God brings the law to the Jews and the gospel for Christians to rescue the heirs of Adam from the death spiral narcissism evident from the very first words Adam utters. The law and the gospel are irrelevant to the new American awakening. It is identity politics, however, and we must understand why. Like the first great awakening, the point of departure for the new American awakening is Adam's declaration, I am innocent. Instead of seeing through this ruse and attributing culpability to everyone without exception, its parishioners divide the world along racial and sexual lines into those who are innocent and those who are not. For the Christian, the systemic problem of man was not systemic racism, but rather man's universal uncleanliness and culpability, for which the gospel good news was the only answer, and without which all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags, Isaiah 64, verse 6. The Adam and Eve of today's great awakening believe otherwise. They claim that they are innocent and without spot, that they are righteous, that the poisonous serpents around them are the culpable ones, and that the oppressive world created by, for the moment, whiteness is the source of the anxiousness that assaults them a hostile force no one can appease. If whiteness can be purged, then the elect can look forward to living in an identity, innocent world. Identity politics does not abide by a legal system committed to the law, however imperfect, to make determinations of guilt and innocence. Because guilt has only one source, for the moment, whiteness. Every injustice has that as its cause. Legal justice is not enough, because legal justice is white justice. The American awakening, the new American awakening, demands a higher form of atonement that the rule of law cannot provide. If you have any doubt about what is happening, peruse the websites of the top 20 law schools in America. The next generation of lawyers and judges is being taught the law of tribes. Destroy the idea that all descend, we are all descendants of Adam, and you do not get the secular world of equality. You get the claim that all of us are descendants of different tribes, each of whom deserves a different kind of justice. Identity politics tells who owes whom what. The horizontal scapegoating of identity politics I have suggested is both a great threat to liberal politics and confidence and an important entree into the question of the relationship between liberalism and Christianity. The vertical scapegoating of Christ involved his humiliation and purgation from the community. The horizontal scapegoating of identity politics also involves humiliation and purgation, exhibit A of which has been whimsically called TDS, or Trump Derangement Syndrome. Now, normal politics involves strong likes and dislikes over presidents and presidential candidates. TDS is not incidental to identity politics. It is, it is its central feature. At the mention of his name, rational conversation ceases and purged words spew forth. We do not need to be penetrating social critics to notice that there are two conversations happening in America today, one that can include Trump and another that cannot. The geographical regions where MAGA hats can and cannot be worn confirms the chasm. We say America is politically polarized, but that only scratches the surface. Something much more fundamental than politics is being worked out here, and we need to get to the heart of it. Let us ask a serious question that the TDS helps us pose. What is the relationship between rational conversation and cathartic rage? Pressing the question further, 
Might the precondition for rational conversation be the successful discharge of cathartic rage toward a sacrificial offering? This idea is discomforting to the modern mind, for which sacrifice is a barbaric relic, relic of pre-modernity. Christianity, we must never forget, is pre-modern. Or rather, it is the fulcrum that separates pre-modern from modern. The interminable blood sacrifice in which the rage of community was discharged on a victim in the pre-modern world was brought to a close by the Christian affirmation that Christ was the one sufficient scapegoat, after which no further blood sacrifice was necessary. The very success of Christianity's word was the cause of the modern incredulity and unease about sacrificial offering. Man could be reasonable because of the need for ongoing rational catharsis toward a victim had come to an end. This insight allows us to make sense of Augustine's remark in the city of God that Christ freed man from the oppressive domination of demonic powers. Much later, in the reasonableness of Christianity, 1695, Locke made a kindred claim. The precondition of enlightenment was Christ's sacrificial offering. Who among theorists of liberalism today take him seriously? Later still, it might be said that because of the passion of Christ had what it had accomplished, uh, that it had accomplished its agonizing task of putting an end to sacrificial offering once and for all, Hegel could write, without giving the matter a second thought, that reason was at the center of the cross. The Enlightenment does not make a, mark a break from Christianity, it marks the victory of Christianity. Both Kant and Hegel took Lutheran communion on their deathbeds. I would also add here, uh, that on this reading, the Reformation is older than Aquinas, who sought to have a synthesis of Christianity and Aristotle. So all this appears in the reading. We start from the position that the sacrificial offering of sin uh, is the problem for which human societies, which human societies cannot long mourn. Now, identity politics walks back this astonishing achievement. Here, the clearing of reason, to coin a phrase, shrinks and is intermittently entangled and overwhelmed by the cathartic rage toward a mortal sacrificial offering. When the one sufficient offering of Christianity is replaced by a mortal scapegoat who must again and again be offered up as an object of cathartic rage, we witness the strange and predictable oscillation in those who suffer from TPS between moments of exemplary lucidity, this is John McMurray's argument that Devin was talking about the other day, uh, and venomous irrationality. Nothing more characterizes TPS than this entanglement and oscillation. For those who suffer from TPS, the clearing of reason, like a sunny clearing in a dense, ever encroaching jungle, must be carved out each day anew. Hence, both the revulsion and pathological 24 7 need to track and register everything he did or said so that rage may be discharged. TPS may wane its form present withdraws from public life. What will not wane? is the entanglement of reason and cathartic rage so characteristic of identity politics. This is what happens when the Christian vertical relationship of undischargeable debt and payment takes the form of divine humiliation, it takes the form of divine humiliation and purgation, is replaced by horizontal. It is difficult to imagine how a political consensus, so necessary if we are to find a workable domestic policies and face foreign threats abroad, can be forged under these circumstances where cathartic rage, horizontal discharge, is operative. In light of what I've said about identity politics, the bastard offspring of Reformation Christianity, the outline of what I take to be the relationship between liberalism and Christianity can be sketched out. First, if identity politics amounts to a third incomplete religion, uh, which now follows on the heels of the French Revolution and Marxism, then we have reason to doubt that secularism has yet to succeed, or stronger yet, reason to believe it cannot succeed for the reason Tokyo gave in volume one, part nine, or two, chapter part nine. 18th century thinkers believed that religion would die down as freedom and enlightenment spread. It is tiresome that the facts do not get clear. Second, following from the first claim, we may ask, if religion is eternal to man, what would count as religion? Might the secular age be better characterized not as an age that breaks with Christianity, but as an age in which one complete incomplete religion follows upon another? so that the West neither goes back to Christianity nor wholly breaks with it, as Nietzsche seemed to observe in the first essay of genealogy, section 10. In which case, we may wonder if having survived the first two incomplete religions, does liberalism have the strength to survive another one and another one after that? 
in it so on what grounds. Third, we should not forget that the first two incomplete religions emerged in a still nominally Christian era. Christianity was not to a not an insignificant extent the antidote to those incomplete religions, as conservative since Burke has argued. We live in a different time, however, in which for now Christianity may less be an antidote to the third incomplete religion than itself caught up and contributing to it as woke church quote communities on both sides of the Roman Catholic Protestant divide and test. This third incomplete religion, which immunitizes the scapegoat in a horizontal relationship between debtor and creditor, creditor daily incapacitates the liberal politics of confidence in such a way that earlier incomplete religions never did and perhaps never could. Whatever their differences, whatever the differences between Locke and Tocqueville may have been and may be, the liberal worlds they envisioned were ones in which citizens labored together to build the world. No such enterprise is remotely possible if what matters first and foremost is the need to establish in your own heart and in the hearts of others whether you are a transgressor or an innocent. Fourth and finally, and as a way of providing the answer to the question of the relationship between liberalism and Christianity, we must wonder on what silent foundation liberalism rested, and perhaps secretly still rests today, such that it could have avoided for so long the peril of tribal politics, of horizontal relations between debtor and creditor, that hobbles so many societies around the globe and has hobbled the multiracial, multi-ethnic society we call our own. It's not far-fetched to wonder if it was not precisely the one sufficient mediator of Christianity whose sacrifice took the pre- and non-Christian affirmative alternative of group scapegoating off the table just enough so that the liberal politics of competence became thinkable at all. The clearing of reason, as I said, as I called it earlier, is an accomplishment made possible once cathartic rage toward the scapegoat has been discharged. Christianity ruled out such rage towards scapegoat, notwithstanding innumerable violations of, its, of this its deepest breakthrough. Anyone who has spent decades in the liberal Middle East, as I have, cannot be struck by just how quickly cathartic rage toward perceived lesser impure groups bubbles up to the surface which may well be one of the principal reasons why such societies can be stabilized by an authorian strongman, but not by the police. To conclude with an answer to the question, can religion coexist and even coexist with liberalism, I doubt liberalism can survive without the reemergence of Christianity that grasps anew its central insight, namely that Christ, the one sufficient scapegoat, takes away the sins of the world. There will always be a scapegoat. Liberal politics is possible with a transcendent scapegoat but not the imminent one of the sort identity politics now offers up. To Brian's question of why the Roman Catholic Church or Nietzsche, you phrased it, Brian, as kind of moral seriousness, but I would put it a different way. Each of them offers a way to deal with the problem of guilt uh, through the one sufficient atonement or Nietzsche, and this is incredibly important for understanding the threat of the all right. Uh, in, in the second essay of genealogy, Nietzsche asks the question, how might man have a tomorrow? And he gives two answers, and he rejects the first one. The first one is through Christian forgiveness. Uh, and he rejects this and says, no, no, there's only one way for us to have a tomorrow, and that is through forgetfulness. So America had slavery, it doesn't matter. Uh, Europe had colonialism, two world wars, and the Holocaust, it doesn't matter. And that's what the all right is going for, and it's a profound threat. Lastly, I would say, well, I, I find identity politics deeply threatening it is at least still using the, the biblical language of transgression and innocence, and I would prefer that than the all right of Thank you. seem to be faced with this choice between Nietzsche or, or devout Catholicism. 
Um, it, it strikes me that both of those, I mean, this is similar to something Josh just said, both of those do seem to be um, different ways of responding to somewhat the same concern, perhaps. Um, if that's the case, and that's, a, that's a, maybe a big if, but if that's the case, um, Ronnie, wouldn't you see a, a, a benevolent role for religion um, in turning people in one direction rather than the other? I may be wrong, but I think there's at least one thing that you might agree with Patrick Deneen about. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever said these words before. Um, but, but I think Patrick said many years ago, I believe, something to the effect of, uh, if you don't like the religious right, just wait for the post-religious right. That's um, Oh, is that is that was that Ross? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I was close. It was three seats over. Uh, two seats over. Um, but and I, I I have the sense that you would agree with that at least. In which case, doesn't uh, if these uh, illiberal or non-liberal concerns are a, a permanent or a nearly permanent feature of human nature, might religion, uh, might post secularism play a, a healthy role within a liberal society? So that's my my first. Uh, a question. The second one, which is closely related, is focused on the if. If those concerns are permanent or, or semi-permanent, um, it seems to me that uh, the, the the concerns, especially the the ones that lead in the direction of Catholicism, would be uh, permanent if uh, if reason doesn't stand in the way. Um, and I'm not sure if reason simply does stand in the way. At least it's, it seems to me a big question. I mean, I, I suppose I shouldn't say this as co-director of the LeFrac Forum on uh, Reason, Science, and Modern Democracy, but I sometimes wonder to what extent modern democracy and reason um, uh, go together, at least to this extent, that secularism seems to go hand in hand with, um, modern democracy seems to go hand in hand with secularism. But what's the basis, the, the ultimate basis for secularism? And in listening to your talk just now, I, I kind of, you said a number of things in defense of secularism, and two really stood out to me. Uh, as maybe the deepest threads that, that you sort of hang your hat on. Uh, on the one hand, there was this quote about um, the world being so vast, the universe being so vast, why would God waste it on, on insignificant us? And it strikes me that that is actually a claim to know something about the divine attributes, um, to know something about divine wisdom. And, uh, uh, and that claim is, I mean, uh, in tension with the other strand, I think, of your uh, uh, of the grounds of your uh, defense of secularism, which was we just don't know the divine attributes, and so the people who claim to know, um, uh, we can rule that out. Uh, it's epistemologically problematic, as you said, and and I find these two strands of uh, uh, on the, the uh, of the grounds of secularism also present in Locke, for instance. You know, on the one hand. God is just, he wouldn't do that. The Pelagianism that Eric has drawn attention to before. On the other hand, nobody knows what God is like. This is, these are things that you find throughout the modern tradition. Um, and so I'm wondering, uh, is there a tension there? And uh, if so, or, or even if not, which is the more important um, basis for, for secularism? Okay. Um, well, I'll try and keep my remarks brief because uh, we three panelists have already used up a lot of time. We should hear some other voices. But let me start in responding to you to make a correction of something that Jenna said, uh, characterizing my view. So I think she said, she uh, referred to me as a spokesperson for the view that liberalism is at odds with religion. That's not my view. Uh, that's not the secularist view. The secularist view is that liberalism is at odds with politicized religion. It's a huge difference. Plenty of space for religion in, in, in America or any other liberal society, and it may contribute in all kinds of ways, social, moral, cultural, great. Let's, let's see in, in the ways in which it helps people to flourish within that society. But politically, civically, here's the fundamental problem, and I've yet to hear anyone who, you know, wants to, you know, toss away liberals and respond to this. And, and you know, I think Frank laid it out pretty well yesterday. So you have in the United States of America, it's a civic community that brings together people who believe that Christ is the redeemer of our sins. People who believe we're still waiting for the Messiah. And people who believe that, uh, 
Muhammad is the crowning prophet. Plus, people who don't think there are any prophets, uh, uh, or there isn't any privileged divine, you know, word uh, that has authority over our lives. So somehow we have to be joined together as citizens uh, to, in a way, such a way that people with these very different beliefs that are not going to be reconciled or, or squared, through, you know, through reason or argument or deliberation, it's just not going to happen. How do you, how can these people live together in one civic community? Uh, well, the, the answer to that is secularism. And, and, and appealing to my own religion is not going to solve that problem. So I think I might, what I get out of Josh's talk is, well, he wants all Americans to be Catholic. Uh, well, sorry, <laughs> that's just not going to happen if the basis that everybody, all citizens, quasi citizens are going to buy into a particular sectarian understanding of how Christ redeems the sins of all human beings. That's not going to happen, so it's not a basis for citizenship. So you have to have secularism, unless you're going to have something like Modi's India, where you know Hinduism is is going to be imposed on non uh, non Hindus. Uh, well, you know, if, if if that's if that's a fundamental problem, I'm with liberals. Can I, can I respond? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I should make myself clear. I, I want liberals. I want the politics of confidence. I'm, I'm driven to the conclusion I'm driven to not because I have a predisposed view of, about religion. I'm driven to it because what I think has happened is, uh, and we're all confronted with this every day in our lives, is that there's a kind of Passover ritual that everyone has to go through to demonstrate their, their innocence. Now, this is, this is a terrible thing. Uh, and what I'm suggesting is that the Christian formulation makes it more difficult. I will never say that Christians are good at this, so I'm, I'll be the first to agree with you that the good things of Christianity can, and every religion can usher in horrible things. Complete agreement. But what I'm suggesting is that, uh, since you mentioned Reinhold Niebuhr, I'll bring him up. I mean, Reinhold Niebuhr uh, said at the end of his life, actually not at the end of his life, in the middle of World War II, he said, the, the one thing I have tried to do is to restore the idea of original sin to the Protestant churches, and I have failed. So my argument here is that it's been the collapse of the mainline churches within which one could think through the problem of death and transgression and see a theological resolution to it. And so I'm agreeing with you about separation. Right? If, if that falters, if the, Rome, if the uh, Protestant churches went soft, and they did, and the Roman Catholic churches our church is, is doing the exact same thing, they're all going so then people are still going to need some way of thinking through stain and transgression and debt. It is not by accident that, the, that of, the, of the three arguments that are offered at the beginning of the Republic, book one, about justice, the very first one is capitalist, debt. And what he's saying is this experience of debt is the most primordial understanding that we have of what justice is. I'm saying the church is turn from the God of judgment who tells you about your debts to him, your unpayable debts, to the God of love. And, and a whole generation of people, both my generation, my age and younger, uh, has, has found in identity politics a way of thinking through transgression and debt. So the collapse of the mainline churches did not give us secularism. It gave us identity politics. This is the crisis that we're facing. So if you can show me how, how the, the what follows upon theology is simple secularism. Great. I've suggested to you that we have now three incomplete religions. So we're not going to get rid of it. So the question is, might it be the case, and this is an operating question, I don't have an answer. Might it be the case that the only possible way in this predominantly Protestant culture country, the only way that, that scapegoating, which is going to come after you and every one of us, the only way it can be diminished is if Protestants get their act together again and realize that, that what's going to have to happen is we, they, or now identity politics parishioners, are looking in the wrong place to solve the problem of debt. That's my argument. Um, I guess this will just pick up exactly where you left off, but connecting it to, you know, Brian's powerful question. For, for any, any of the th three of you, um, 
supposing that it's correct that young people unhappy with current conditions, unhappy with identity politics, find themselves torn between Nietzsche and Catholicism, why aren't they drawn to Protestants? That's sort of the nub of the question, and then just to expand it a bit, I think in all of this discussion, the discussion of you know how does Martin Luther King fit together with the history of American secularism, right? Surely the answer, or a partial answer, is that the United States, unlike Modi's India or post-revolutionary Iran or you know other other examples that you could multiply, sustained a combination of formal secularism and Protestant consensus for a long period of time that was whatever one thinks of it pretty important to American stability over over multiple generations, right? That, you know, one, one could say in the American experiment, one had evidence that you could have a, you could have a liberalism resting in some sense on Christian principles without turning inquisitorial or theocratic, but the Christianity that it rested on was Protestant, right? And then, Identity politics, you know, it is the heir of Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was a Protestant. The bastions of identity politics are set about with Protestant churches, Protestant monuments. At every, you know, the all, you know, Brian and I both live in New Haven. You wander through downtown New Haven. It's one monument after another to a Protestant culture that was clearly foundational in some sense to whatever we call. American liberalism, um, and so, you know, as a you know, one of the Protestant converts to Catholicism, I'm very happy, in a sense, to with the idea that you know we can think through Christianity's relationship to liberalism by drawing on the Catholic Pierre Menon and the lapsed Catholic, or whatever whatever you want to call them, Carl Schmitt, but isn't it still is a peculiar reality, right? That at least among sort of the American intelligentsia, obviously the Protestantism continues to exist as a mass phenomenon, but as a kind of intellectual option, it seems to have just dropped off the map. And I'm, cu I'm just curious what response anyone has to that issue. Well, I'll be highly controversial on this one. Why, why stop now? Uh, <laughs> so I'm said cryptically, path dependency matters. And uh, I'll just put it this way. I'm, so what I mentioned in my comments was that there's a there's a, a shift in the fusionist balance between the libertarians and the traditionists. Another way of looking at this is that we're in a kind of Roman Catholic moment. That a lot of cultural conservatives are saying, well, uh, tradition matters. And, uh, and, and the Catholic Church gives us the kind of richness and, and breadth um, on the basis of which we can heal the wounds of liberalism. But I don't think, I'll just be as blunt as I can, I don't think it can answer the identity politics critique. Because cultural conservatives are, are, are talking about, okay, we're, we're, we no longer have the free market veto, and isn't this wonderful? But they're not paying attention to the firestorm that is right outside their door. And that is identity politics. Look, identity politics attacks tradition. It attacks it. And so what I'm hearing are conservatives, Roman Catholics, but not only Roman Catholics, holding up tradition, holding up the edifice of the church. And, and these deformed Protestants who are doing identity politics respond by saying, it's all stained. It's all stained. And I have not yet heard a conservative, Roman Catholic or otherwise, answer that. I've heard them talk among themselves, but I've not heard them answer that, which is the reason why identity politics continues to race through all of our institutions. And so while there's a, while, well, well, as I said to you earlier, I do think Roman Catholicism and Nietzsche, it's not about moral richness, whatever you say, it's about finding a way to deal with that. It's not an accident that the Eastern European countries can say to the fallen Protestant Western European countries, we know how to solve the problem of debt. We don't have to renounce our nations. Because the, what the left has offered through identity politics is this. They say, your nations are stained, your families are stained, your dirty fossil fuels are disgusting, 
uh, and, and you have no Christianity left, come unto me, all of you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Renounce your nation, renounce your heteronormative family. The problem is stain is the, is the most profound problem we're faced with right now. And I don't think invoking tradition is going to be enough. It may convince intellectual elites who are, who are at Yale and, and other places, uh, and once at Georgetown, but as Patrick will attest, there's nothing there now. Uh, but it's not going to convince the, the folks who, are, who continue to press forward with this understanding that stain is irredeemable. And my point in that Protestant culture, and by the way, there are far evangelicals who are beginning to see that this Protestant thing must reawaken. If you have no way of addressing transcendently the problem of stain, in the imminent claim that the identity politics people are making, then there's no way you can respond to it. You can talk about tradition to your blue in the face. They don't care. It's all poison and stain and leprosy. Uh, I know sure. be very quick. Just to state the obvious, it's clearly not Brian's view that one has to choose between Catholicism and Nietzsche because he's neither Catholic nor Nietzschean. Nor do I think that. I'm neither Catholic nor Nietzsche. So surely there are other alternatives. Why should we get fixated on those two if anyone be forced into an either or the problem or a choice between those two in particular? Uh, let me also just briefly, guess, in relation to Josh, uh, you know, it goes on and on about uh, identity politics, and uh, you know, Dougie's going to uh, uh, diagnose me with uh, Trump arrangement syndrome. But, you know, the, the people who are staging a, a revolutionary coup against the American constitutional order were Trumpites. And he has not a word to say about that. It, it, you know, it wasn't the identity politics left. I was trying to overlook the rule of law. I, I, just, I don't see why people get unbelievably fixated on Trump and continue long after he's out of office. It never ends, and it can't ever end. A very short follow-up question about the churches. Uh, could you say something about the black churches? Uh, I would have thought that they would, uh, you know, be a little bit more uh, traditional uh, in holding to uh, Christ as Savior. Uh, is there any hope that the black churches will lead the charge against Wolfman? So this is a great question. I, every, you want to ask something? So, uh, you know, I'm very nervous when I, when I say I didn't politics after whiteness because the last thing in the world I want to defend is racial politics. I hope that's clear. But I work very closely with Bob Woodson of the, of the Woodson Center. And once a month, it's Bob Woodson, Glenn Lowry, John McWhorter, Jason Riley, basically all the prominent black conservatives um, gather and have this fantastic conversation. And, and the great big battle that's going on within the black churches now is exactly over this matter. You've got a whole group of, uh, let's call them traditional conservative uh, churches, who, uh, out of the Martin Luther King tradition, but against them also is this group um, that are really pushing the woke agenda within the black churches. And there's a titanic battle going on. Okay, thanks for a very interesting panel. My question is also for Josh, and it's about how you define religion, and why you would say that the things that you've named are incomplete forms of religion, rather than being so incomplete that they're not really religion at all, if essential to religion is a concern with eternity, a concern with transcendence, a concern and a central presence of reverence and a sense that what we have is giving meaning to the whole of our life. It seems to me that especially identity politics doesn't really meet any of those criteria and might it not be more useful to think of it in terms of a reaction to the lack of an outlet for spiritedness, for contentiousness, for our tribal, political, natural um, tendencies and for pride, and the way in which we want to be proud and say we're good and you're bad, and that's part of human nature, but we can't do that now because of liberalism. We're constrained on all fronts except the front. We can, we can fight more strongly for equality. Well, I think um, 
reason I invoked Edwards was because it strikes me that the, the central problem of the Protestant tradition was irredeemable stain with the view to eternal life, right? How do, how do you get past the problem of irredeemable stain? So I'm saying this is a deformation of Protestantism which has that particular problem as its central issue, the problem of stain. It's not, well, it doesn't think in terms of the, the categories that you were invoking, its central problem is stain. The Great Awakenings were very much concerned with this. And what I'd like to ask then in response, or in your response and others is, do you think that my characterization of the current moment where people are fixated on purity and stain is in fact incorrect? Part of what we're fixated on, for sure. But I don't think in a, in a Christian spirit, and I guess even more strongly, I would say that doesn't seem to me to be the thing that religion is about. Um, I uh, enjoyed the panel very much, I, I, um, and uh, although I, I disagree with a great deal of what uh, Josh said, I, I, I think that some of the uh, comparisons, the sort of resonances between the, this contemporary movement and Puritanism in particular uh, are obvious and very powerful. And one I would add to your, your list is um, uh, hyper-literalism uh, along with a complete absence of a sense of humor, uh, which, which go together. So uh, I was thinking of this as you were talking because just before I left Cambridge Mass, uh, I read that um, a production of the Mikado had been put on um, it, which uh, is now completely censored and sort of put into the year 3000 and called the Milkmaid. Um, so that, you know, where the libretto has been rewritten, rewritten so that it's no longer, um, uh, you know, uh, racist. And then you sort of think, if you watch the Mikado and you think it's about Japan, <laughs> you know, that there's something that they're aiming for verisimilitude but missing, uh, that's, you know, yeah, that sort of says all you need to know. But anyway, I really had a question for Jenna because um, I, uh, I so enjoyed what you had to say, uh, and um, and I uh, and it resonates, I think, with a concern that I have about the, the framing of this question, the liberalism and religion question, and the secularism question, which which is sort of parasitic on it, um, and um, uh, sort of how we draw this boundary because. The, the, um, uh, what your discussion of Schmidt, in a, in a strange way, reminded me of um, is uh, this sort of famous passage at the end of Parfit's um, Reasons and Persons, where um, he makes this, uh, this extraordinary claim. He says that basically the history of ethics, the, the study of ethics, is in its infancy. We can expect great progress um, uh, in, uh, in, in the development of, of moral philosophy and, uh, and ethical theory because um, it's only once religion was, uh, was sort of gotten out of the way that we could have a proper, freestanding, uh, uh, rationalist ethics. And you know, if you know anything about the history of, of religion, that's an extraordinary claim, right? because in essence, he's agreeing with Schmidt that um, religion, by which he means Christianity, uh, and you know, is voluntarist Christianity. It's uh, that is, it's the Christianity of you know the arbitrary will saying thou shalt. Uh, and not giving reasons uh, because you know the, the whole point of it is to you know, is the, that would argue in a circle. So, um, but for people, for the overwhelming, in a way, the circle back to something that I was trying to say yesterday. For the overwhelming uh, majority of theologians, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, who are rationalists and not voluntarists, um, uh, the 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 distinction between a religious argument and a secular argument. Uh, when it comes to things like morality, justice, and, and all the rest, is um, is a is a false distinction, because the whole point is to say that God is a God of reason, and so what God commands must uh, be identical with what reason requires, uh, and so we're just having the same debate. I mean, you know, the the, the question, how, how would a just God punish? Uh, is answered by reflecting on the nature of punishment and what would justify it and what wouldn't. I mean, so in other words, um, are you? I, I, I took you maybe to be moving in this direction and perhaps trying to break down this barrier just a little bit uh, and argue that that if you if you complicate your picture of the history of Christianity and Christian theology, then this neat distinction between secular and religious um, uh, begins to seem much less tenable, or at least that's 
Uh, I, I was wondering if that's something you would you'd sign up for. I think we'll you respond to it. Okay, I'll be, I'll be brief. Thank you for, for that remark. Um, I think you're right. As I was uh, hearing your remarks yesterday, uh, I was thinking that in some ways the Schmidt the non distinction could be articulated as breaking down into a, a anti Pelagian and Pelagian distinction. But in reality, both of them are. Or even more just voluntarist rationalists. Or voluntarist yeah. rationalists, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, I was hesitant to put those terms <coughs> on it because I yeah, said yeah. it's complicated, more yeah. complicated than I really understand. But, um, but, I, but I also, but really each of those things. Little bit more complicated, I think, but on a much more fruitful manner. Um, because as I, I took you to say, um, most of uh, religious people are struggling with the Euthyphro question, right? They, some extremes they plunk down on one side or the other, but the fact is, this is a real question, it's a perennial question. And for that reason, the distinction, I think, the distinction between the secular and the religious is not, um, it, it doesn't even really have. So I, I think I agree with your suggestion. Okay. If you wouldn't mind joining me in applause for our panelists.